The Strange But True story featured on this podcast contains details some people may find distressing. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Chaya Samuel and things are about to get weird. Hello, hello. I'm so glad you're joining me today for another episode of Things Are About To Get Weird. If strange but true stories are your cup of tea, you're in good company here. This podcast has a little bit of everything from unsolved mysteries to true crime tales and even a few unexplained phenomena, which brings us neatly to the subject of today's episode. Now, when I told people that I was planning to do this podcast, and actually since it launched as well, I've had a handful of people say to me, are you going to do an episode about spontaneous human combustion? And the answer is, yes, I am. This topic has been on my list from day one. There is a lot to talk about and actually a lot to debate as well. I'm sure I don't need to give this warning given the subject matter, but please do be warned that this episode will get pretty graphic. I have several stories to tell you today, so if you're prepared and ready to learn about this bizarre concept, let's dive in. I'm a big fan of that meme that goes around where people say things like, quicksand hasn't been anywhere near as much of a problem in my adult life as my childhood self believed it would be, or maybe instead of quicksand, it's the Bermuda Triangle, or sharks, or lava. But for me, that thing was always spontaneous combustion. We didn't have all that much need to be concerned about quicksand or lava where I grew up in Cheshire and Greater Manchester, so those ideas never preoccupied me too much. But I remember first reading about spontaneous human combustion in one of my Strange But True story books, and even as a kid, I was like, no way, this can't be real, but it would always crop up in those kind of books. And whilst I wouldn't say it was a fear of mine, It was always kind of in the back of my mind and the idea of it still completely fascinates me today. When I was young, I'm sure I had a very simplistic view of this phenomenon, probably along the lines of, yeah, once every few years, this crazy random thing happens and it's very, very rare. I guess kind of like someone dying from falling in quicksand, for example. And if I ever mentioned it to an adult, they just tell me not to worry about it and then it would never happen to me or anyone I knew. But the reality, or should I say alleged reality, of spontaneous combustion, at least in humans, is a lot more complicated and in many ways a lot weirder than I'd even realised. I suppose the first thing that I should really mention is that the concept of spontaneous human combustion is considered to be pseudoscience. In other words, it's not regarded as proven, there isn't enough concrete evidence for it, and it's more widely thought of as a theory or a belief than anything that could be properly explained using established scientific principles. In general, the scientific community does not consider it to be real. However, as we'll find out as we talk about some apparent examples of it occurring over the years, whilst there are some cases of suspected spontaneous human combustion that can be explained by alternative causes, there are also some that can't. In fact, even as recently as 2010, spontaneous combustion was listed as the official cause of death on a person's death certificate. Before we get to those examples though, let's look at the basic idea behind this incredibly strange concept. The most straightforward definition of spontaneous human combustion is the notion of a human being bursting into flames or combusting without the presence of an ignition source, hence the spontaneous part. The last bit of that definition is the most crucial part without the presence of an ignition source. And this is the thing that causes controversy and questions to be asked in almost every recorded case. We can actually look back as far as the 17th century to see examples of this apparent phenomenon or at least something very similar to it being recorded and documented. In 1663, a Danish anatomist called Thomas Bartholin wrote about the cause of death of a woman in Paris who had died in her sleep. He noted that she went up in ashes and smoke whilst the straw mattress she slept on was completely uncharred, which seems weird enough in itself and as you'll come to find out, is definitely somewhat of a theme in these cases. 
The idea also made it into various works of literature too, with one of the most notable being in Charles Dickens' novel Bleak House. If you've not read it, there's a character called Mr Crook, and he's the owner of kind of a junk shop, if you will. 19th century spoiler alert, but the character does die in the book as a result of spontaneous combustion, leaving a, quote, dark, greasy coating on the walls and ceilings, which is lovely. Interestingly, Charles Dickens received a bit of backlash about this, with some critics saying it sounded implausible as a cause of death, but our Charles wasn't about to back down. Bleak House had initially been released as a series, which was quite common back then, and when the full novel was published, he included a detailed paragraph in the preface, defending his decision to feature spontaneous combustion in the story. He noted that there were about 30 cases of it on record, including one we'll come to in a moment, and he briefly discusses a couple of these cases and ends his statement by writing... I shall not abandon the facts until there shall have been a considerable spontaneous combustion of the testimony on which human occurrences are usually received, which is the sassiest wordplay ever. I just love how he wrote. I'm a big Charles Dickens fan. So let's look at one of the mysterious deaths Charles referenced in the Bleak House preface, that of Countess Cornelia Zangari Bandi. She was an Italian noblewoman born on the 20th of July 1664 and was actually the grandmother of the man who would later become Pope Pius VI. On the evening of the 15th of March, 1731, according to an account from the time by scholar Giuseppe Bianchini, Cornelia was described as seeming dull and heavy whilst eating dinner. After she'd eaten, she was taken to her bedroom by her maid, who spent several hours chatting and praying with her. The maid eventually left the room once Cornelia had fallen asleep, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. However, when the maid realised Cornelia hadn't woken up at her usual time the next morning, she went to check on her and was greeted by a horrifically grim scene. About a metre or around three feet from the bed was a pile of ashes, and the room was filled with soot. Amongst the ashes, Cornelia's lower legs, with the stockings still on, three fingers and the front of her skull were found fairly intact, which must have been the most disturbing thing to witness. I feel awful for her maid. The furniture, bed and floor were completely untouched by any fire damage, although they were covered in what was described as a greasy, stinking moisture, which I assume inspired Charles Dickens when writing Crook's death in Bleak House. There was also an oil lamp covered in ashes, but with no oil left in it. Now, whilst this case is frequently cited as being a possible example of spontaneous human combustion, there are elements within it that you could draw on to explain or debunk this theory. For example, there were reports that said that the Countess was a big brandy drinker and would even use it topically on her skin as she believed it helped to relieve physical pain. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. There was also the empty oil lamp I mentioned on the floor near to her remains as well as the wicks of two candles in candlesticks on a table. Now, especially with more modern cases, coroners always try to look for possible ignition sources. Clearly, in this case, if Cornelia did have alcohol on her skin and perhaps had had an accident with the oil lamp and had been set on fire, this could sound like a reasonable explanation, right? For me, though, what I can't get my head around is that nothing else in the room was affected by the fire. This was 1731. It's not like her bedding or the furniture would have had a flame-resistant coating. There was evidence that Cornelia had got out of bed at some point during the night as her sheets had been moved around. So, say for argument's sake, she'd got up, reached for the oil lamp, perhaps fumbled it and accidentally set her clothing on fire and was consumed by the flames. Doesn't it seem likely that the lamp would have been dropped and smashed or she would have panicked and moved around the room frantically further than just a metre from her bed? It's too weird, it just seems far too neat. 
Now, when you hear the story of Cornelia's death and life, for that matter, it makes the fact that Charles Dickens referenced her even more interesting. And that's because in the 18th and 19th centuries, the concept of spontaneous combustion was quite widely accepted in society as possibly being a form of karma, if you like, for living a life of debauchery with Cornelia having a very privileged lifestyle, being very fond of brandy, I'm sure attending lots of social events and parties, it probably seemed that she fit the bill. Perhaps Charles Dickens prescribed to this idea himself, and that's why he was so committed to defending the existence of the phenomenon. Just a thought, but interesting nonetheless. Now, strangely, in many of the more modern examples of potential spontaneous combustion, there are some bizarre parallels with Cornelia's case. For example, on the 28th of March 1970 in Dublin, Ireland, the remains of 89-year-old Margaret Hogan were found in a chair in the front room of her home. Just like Cornelia, all that remained of Margaret's body was ash, with the exception of the lower parts of her legs, which were again intact. Apart from some charring on the chair and the floor directly below her, there seemed to be no evidence of any other fire damage within the room. However, there was evidence of some intense heat damage. The screen of her TV was completely melted, as were a bunch of plastic flowers that had sat in the middle of the room. According to an article in the Irish Times, the damage to her body was so severe that, quote, a pathologist who carried out the post-mortem on the remains said that he had never seen such complete destruction of human tissue. There seemed to be no obvious source of potential ignition anywhere in the room. There was a small coal fire, but no link could be found between it and what had happened to Margaret. The Dublin city coroner at the time was called Dr. Boffin, side note, epic name, and he basically concluded that her death would conform to what is known as spontaneous combustion, but not because he was seriously suggesting that Margaret burst into flames for no reason, but more so because the source of ignition couldn't be determined. Which I do understand with him being a medical professional, but the fact that there is no final explanation and that the cause of the fire was officially ruled as unknown, it really bugs me. It also must be really difficult for a family to accept a finding of unknown. I really feel for the people close to Margaret because not only did she die in a horrific way, but when there's no conclusive explanation, it must be so tough to come to terms with. Now, yet another example of a person burning to death in unexplained circumstances, leaving only a pile of ashes with the lower parts of their legs intact, was the case of a man named Henry Thomas. Henry was 73 years old at the time of his death in 1980, and his remains were found in his home in South Wales, with half of the chair that he was sitting in also destroyed. Now, I do want to talk about something which is pretty grim, even more grim than what we've already heard, and it's a scientific explanation as to why there are a number of cases which have this similarity with the condition in which the bodies are found, and it's called the wick effect. Okay, so picture a candle. You have the wick on the inside and it's surrounded by wax. This theory says that the human body is kind of like a reverse candle. The body itself is like the wax and our clothing or hair is like the wick. So say a person was around a heat source like a cigarette or some kind of ember and it ignited their clothing or hair, i.e. the wick. If it wasn't extinguished, the fire could then break the skin, releasing fat, which is then absorbed by the clothing, and this creates the ideal conditions to not only keep a body burning for a really long time, but with the amount of fat in an average human, it could be enough to fully combust the body. Scientists have experimented with this theory, I believe using pigs, which I couldn't bring myself to delve into any further, but I'm choosing to believe the pigs weren't alive. And the experiment showed that this way of burning does produce minimal fire damage to the surroundings. Now, the reason the lower legs and feet are often left intact is one, because fire tends to burn upwards. So unless the combustion started from the feet, they're not going to be as affected. And two, feet tend to have less fat on them. So they will burn less easily if we take the wick effect as a given. I hope that makes some kind of sense. I'm really not a scientist, but it's definitely interesting. 
However, whilst the wick effect does sound realistic and reasonable to me, there are definitely a couple of things it doesn't explain in my view. Firstly, whilst I can accept that the wick effect could take hold of a person who was, say, completely unconscious from the get-go and leave minimal damage to surrounding furniture and other items as the person doesn't move, what happens if the person is conscious? It would kind of be assuming that every case of suspected spontaneous human combustion that has been documented throughout history involved someone who had maybe had a heart attack or passed away from other natural causes prior to burning, and that's why their remains end up being in one contained place, while the rest of the room is largely untouched. I mean, look, it's definitely possible, especially considering that the vast majority of suspected cases do occur amongst the elderly, but it still does feel a bit odd and pretty convenient to me. Secondly, and perhaps more significantly, what the wick effect idea doesn't solve is the source of ignition issue. Now, I mentioned cigarettes a few minutes ago. As you might be able to imagine, a lot of reported cases of spontaneous combustion have been explained away as smoking-related accidents, where a person has, say, fallen asleep or passed out or even died of natural causes with a lit cigarette nearby and started a fire which has engulfed them. The cigarette theory was actually cited in possibly the most well-known case talked about in relation to spontaneous human combustion, that of Mary Reeser. Mary's remains were found reduced to ashes in a chair in her home in Florida in 1951. However, her daughter-in-law later spoke about the family's belief that, as she was a smoker, a cigarette was likely the source of ignition here. The evidence of this definitely hasn't been found in every case, and if I were a coroner, I'd want to know that the person was known to be a smoker, that there were cigarette packets or ashtrays or lighters in other parts of the house, but in a lot of cases with that unknown fire cause attached to them, there doesn't look to be any evidence that cigarettes could have been to blame, which leaves me with so many questions I can barely stand it. There's definitely a lot more information available about Mary Reese's case, so I definitely encourage you to read more into it if you're interested, but personally, I think because of the family speaking out and saying they think it was likely a cigarette-related incident, this case feels a lot more explainable to me than many others do. All of this source of ignition talk leads us to possibly the most famous scientific study relating to spontaneous human combustion. It was a two-year research project carried out by Joe Nickel, who is a scientific investigator, and John F. Fisher, who's a forensic analyst, and they published their findings in 1984. They thoroughly examined 30 cases and, according to Joe Nickel, concluded that, quote, They were accidents, often involving the elderly or incapacitated, and the extensive destruction was due to special factors such as the wick effect. Now, according to the researchers, they felt that the reasons that details around the sources of ignition were sometimes left out of published reports on the cases, and obviously media reports as well, was to add to this air of mystery around suspected spontaneous combustion deaths. And in the cases that they examined there was always a plausible source of ignition near to the body. They also made a point around alcohol and the potential intoxication of those who had died, not so much in the sense that alcohol in their systems would have made them more flammable, if you like, but more so that it would have made them more careless about their surroundings. It is worth noting that Joe Nickel is a well-known sceptic, and most of his career has been centred around investigating and often debunking ideas, especially if they're related to something paranormal. But that's in no way me suggesting that their work was less valid. In fact, it was interesting to see that even after their two-year investigation, Nickel and Fisher still believed that unexplained or unusual cases of this nature should be looked at on a case-by-case basis and cautioned against a, quote, single simplistic explanation for all unusual burning deaths, which brings us to the story I referenced at the very start of this episode. The year is 2010, and in the early hours of the 22nd of December in Galway, Ireland, a man named Tom Mannion hears the smoke alarm of the house next door loudly beeping. Concerned for his elderly neighbour, 76-year-old Michael Fatty, he heads out of his home and starts banging on Michael's door, but there is no answer. 
he sees smoke coming from the house and immediately calls the fire brigade. When the emergency services arrive at the house, they gain access and make an awful discovery. Michael was found lying on his back with his head close to an open fireplace and his body was completely burned. The damage to his body and internal organs was so extensive that it was really impossible for the pathologist who carried out his post-mortem to gain any insights into how he might have died. Following this, a coroner named Dr. Kieran McLaughlin begins to investigate Michael's death further. Together with a whole team of forensic experts, he examined the fireplace that Michael's remains were found next to, but despite looking into the possibility extensively, they found that the fire in the fireplace was not the source of ignition that would explain the blaze. As with almost all of the other cases I've mentioned today, whilst Michael's body was entirely cremated, the only other damage in the room was to the floor directly below him and the ceiling directly above him. The fire hadn't spread to any other parts of the room and nothing else was affected by the flames. After Dr. McLaughlin concluded his investigations, he said he gave a lot of thought to the cause of death, consulting medical textbooks and carrying out extra research to try and work out what on earth happened on the morning of the 22nd of December. Eventually, he returned a verdict he had never recorded before in his 25 years as a coroner, saying, this fire was thoroughly investigated, and I'm left with the conclusion that this fits into the category of spontaneous human combustion, for which there is no adequate explanation. Now, given how controversial this idea is in the scientific and medical communities, this caused quite a stir, as I'm sure you can imagine. Although Michael's family accepted the findings of the coroner's report, his daughter did comment that it left them with no real explanation as to how their father died, which must have been incredibly hard for them. There were comments at the time from various people in the scientific and forensic fields who were a bit uncomfortable with spontaneous human combustion being recorded as Michael's official cause of death. For example, Mike Green, who's a retired professor of pathology, said that although he himself had examined one suspected case of spontaneous combustion in his career, he's quoted as saying, There is a source of ignition somewhere, but because the body is so badly destroyed, the source can't be found. I think if the heavens were striking in cases of spontaneous combustion, then there would be a lot more cases. I go for the practical, the mundane explanation. But for me, I can't understand why Dr. McLaughlin would risk his reputation of 25 years and put this label on the case if he hadn't completely exhausted every other possibility. He could have very easily chosen to return a verdict of unknown, like in countless other examples throughout history, but he actively opted not to. Of course, as with all of these cases, it's possible that the evidence of the ignition source was destroyed in the fire, but with this case being so recent, and with the team having modern forensic techniques at their disposal, it does feel very weird to me that no evidence whatsoever was found to explain what happened to Michael. As with all as yet unprovable ideas, totally alternative explanations and theories do pop up from time to time, and I wanted to share two of them with you today. The first one has totally gripped me, and I'm hoping that at some point some further research is done into it because I totally went down a rabbit hole on this one. It's all to do with something called ball lightning, and I actually think I'm going to have to do a whole episode on it because holy moly, it's wild. This theory runs deep, and not just when we're talking about spontaneous combustion. For our purposes today, though, in 2001, a chemical engineer from the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, New Zealand, called John Abrahamson, noted that the scientific ideas behind ball lightning could have a potential link with the chemical reaction that takes place during spontaneous human combustion. In a nutshell, over the years, there have been tens of thousands of reported sightings of basketball-sized glowing orbs of light that float above the ground, usually when a thunderstorm is nearby. An article in the New Scientist magazine from April 2000 states that, A leading theory suggests that ball lightning forms when a lightning strike vaporises silica in soil. 
the silicon vapour condenses into a fine dust that is bound together by electrical charges into a floating ball, which would oxidise and glow. Ooh, it's kind of spooky. Now, John Abrahamson noted that this process could potentially help to account for reported cases of spontaneous human combustion, saying, This is circumstantial only, but the charring of human limbs seen in a number of ball lightning cases are very suggestive that this mechanism may have also occurred where people have had limbs combusted. Now, let me tell you why I found this theory so intriguing. It reminded me of something that I read when researching Margaret Hogan's death, the lady from Dublin that I spoke about earlier. There are multiple witness accounts recorded by police at the time from people who reported seeing a ball of orange light near to Margaret's window. I genuinely got chills when I put these two things together, even though I know that John Abrahamson wasn't necessarily suggesting that ball lightning itself could be responsible for cases of human combustion, more so that it's the chemical reaction that could be similar, but still, I did get some goosebumps, I can't lie. Secondly, one other alternative theory was presented by a crime and fantasy writer called Michael Harrison, who suggested that spontaneous human combustion was a result of poltergeist activity, I imagine because of the very physical nature of it and because of how it affects the body. He actually wrote an entire book about the idea, and it was called Fire from Heaven, A Study of Spontaneous Combustion in Human Beings. It was first published in 1976, and then it was republished just four days before I was born, actually, on the 1st of December 1990. But reviews of the book have been generally quite unfavourable, and the consensus seems to be that his ideas verge on mocking any scientific explanations for the phenomenon, and doesn't offer any evidence to back up his poltergeist theory. The book does go into a huge number of historical cases which are suspected to have involved spontaneous combustion, and although I haven't seen them myself, I did read a review on Goodreads from someone who said they remembered that the book featured photos of charred bodies which they would take great delight in scaring their school friends with, which made me feel a bit queasy if I'm honest. The book concludes with Harrison writing, Spontaneous human combustion, fatal or non-fatal, belongs to the extensive range of poltergeist phenomena. If this kind of explanation sounds like it's up your street, I believe the book is pretty widely available to buy online, so it could be worth a read. I just perhaps proceed with caution. It kind of makes me wonder that with him being a fantasy writer, whether the book was meant to be taken as fiction rather than factual, but the jury's out on that one. I had to throw this one in there though, because as I'm sure you'll come to learn throughout the course of things are about to get weird, if there's something I can't resist, it's a ghost story. So what do I think? I believe there's every possibility that a large number of the apparent cases could be explainable with further evidence, be that sources of ignition that were destroyed in the flames, or by using more modern forensic techniques that simply weren't available at the time. But as much as the logical part of my brain is shouting at me right now, I feel like there could be a huge missing puzzle piece here, whether that's scientific research that hasn't even been conceived of yet, perhaps around ball lightning, or even something paranormal, there are just a few too many things that don't add up for me in every case, not to let my mind wander. I would say though that it's worth remembering that suspected cases of spontaneous human combustion are incredibly rare, so I truly don't know whether it's something that will even be actively researched again anytime soon. I truly can't wait to hear your thoughts, so please do let me know which possible explanations you find most compelling, or if there are any that you think are complete rubbish. I know that this is a subject that's going to keep me awake at night for many more years to come. A huge, huge thank you for sticking with me until the end of this episode. I know it's been a heavy one, especially on the science front, but hopefully you've all found this as frustratingly, bizarrely fascinating as I have. You know the drill. As always, I would love to give shout outs to the sources that helped me research this episode. Articles from The New Scientist, Britannica and HowStuffWorks.com, a 2018 article from The Irish Times, a 2011 piece from The Independent.ie, and another from the BBC, Wikipedia, and Joe Nichols' website. 
There are now even more ways to get in touch with me and I would love you to join me on whichever social platforms you prefer. So our Instagram handle is at things get weird podcast on twitter it's at about to get weird and after a few of you asked me i recently created a facebook page too so if you search things are about to get weird you'll find it on there you can also email me at things get weird podcast at gmail.com if you've listened to a few episodes by now and you've enjoyed them i would massively appreciate a review or rating on spotify or apple Podcasts. it literally only takes two seconds but it makes a huge huge difference if you do leave a rating or a review please do let me know as i would love to say a personal thank you until next time take care of yourself and others and keep it weird but the good kind of weird Thank you.